Thank you for the intro, Remy. That, that helps explain, because I thought the first thing I was going to have to answer is why is this idiot brought a wind turbine to an ME conference? But as he says, because there is some marine energy in there, there's a wave energy converter attached in there. So bear with me, there's, there's logic in this somewhere. So that's who we are. We're the technology developer. Uh, we develop a floating wind platform that happens to integrate a wave energy converter. And that's actually our clever bit, so hence why we focus on the marine energy bit here, is that is where our IP lies, is in the wave energy converter, and especially in the PTO that's with that. The company's Danish. <laughs> It's headquartered, uh, technically it's headquartered in a place called Bandholm, which probably nobody's ever heard of, but the biggest office is in Copenhagen. Uh, we have an engineering office in Norway, and then myself, I'm the general manager of FPP Limited, which is a wholly owned subsidiary based in the UK. Uh, the purpose of that subsidiary is actually to commercialize the technology. We're floating wind, we need deep water, we need at least 45 meters, preferably 50 meters and over and uh, Danish waters only have 42 metres of water depth at their deepest point, so ironically they've developed a technology they can't use, <laughs> hence why they need us. What is the technology itself? Well, first of all, it's not just a picture, it's not just a concept, we have done something. Uh, when we say we've been around since 2004, we have done something on those almost 13 years, uh, and the culmination of that would be this, that's our half-scale prototype, P37. I won't bore you with where the naming comes from, but all our devices are P and then a number. The P actually stands for Poseidon. Uh, the original inventor didn't speak very good English and wanted to call it Poseidon's organ because of the keys on it, but someone explained to him that's not the best name to use. So it got shortened gradually to P, and the number is basically the capture width of the device, the wave capture width, so on the cross arm that you see. The P37 was deployed in Danish waters, being half scale that we could find a place deep enough. And that was actually deployed in the Vindeby wind farm, which was the world's first offshore wind farm. It's also the first offshore wind farm to be decommissioned, hence we're also decommissioned. That, that's no longer there. Uh, we were grid connected through that. We supplied compliant power to the grid uh, over our test periods. And we learned a lot. The bottom picture is a, uh, sorry, the bottom right picture is a good one to prove we can survive something. That was the biggest uh, wind wave storm on Danish record. Danish record, so it's not that impressive compared to the Atlantic, but Still, half scale, it's still impressive. The other picture that's there that we use a lot uh, is the bottom left one. And the reason we use that a lot is it shows brilliantly one of the synergies between combining wind and wave. Uh, anybody that knows the offshore wind market knows that access is a major issue, actually getting men onto the turbine. I heard recently, I, I can't reference it so I can't back it up, but I heard recently they average around about 18 interventions a year per turbine. And if the wave height is greater than one and a half meters HS, it's off, you can't get on the turbine. With that one, with that picture, it shows actually the boat in there in the lee of the wave energy absorbers. They absorb so much of the wave energy, they create a, an artificial harbor offshore and improve access. And that picture we like because that's not actually our boat, that's Dong Energy's boat, who are a shareholder in us, hence why they provided us a grid connection through their wind farm. Uh, when they couldn't access their fixed offshore wind turbines, they would go and sit on our platform and drink our coffee in the office because it had a heater and a radio and things, but they gave us a grid connection, so fair's fair. As I say, that's the culmination of all our testing and development so far, but we have done a lot more of it and we continue to do a lot more of it. Uh, there's various things, so wave and basin testing, sorry, flume and basin testing go without saying. Of course we do that, everybody here does that. Uh, we also do a lot of testing on our PTO. Uh, the top left picture is our power takeoff system for the wave energy converter. We are still running testing on that, and that's kind of twofold. Firstly, it helps, um, actually, it's, it's the IKEA chair test, it's survivability. You know, the, the old advert with the bounce a chair for ages in IKEA? That's what that's doing. We run it until something breaks and find out why it broke. But more than that, it also helps us develop the control algorithm, which is a really key point in it. But the bits themselves, there's not actually that much to it. Uh, combining them is difficult. Thanks, thanks for pointing that out, Remy. Always nice to hear you're doing something difficult. Not that I'm doing much. I'm, uh, I, I'm reminded all the time that I'm not a real engineer anymore. But we combine a platform as our main thing, a big, stable platform. It's a semi-sub platform. They've been used in oil and gas for decades now. Uh, other people use them. Ours is a little bit different in that it's built up of panel sections instead of a truss structure. But otherwise, it's a stable platform for you to put a wind turbine on. Commercial, off the shelf, uh, 
as off the shelf as they can be. We're not big enough and ugly enough to try and develop one of them as well. Uh, the platform itself at the moment at the commercial scale is designed to take an 8 megawatt turbine, uh, but you, know, you can go down to about 5 megawatts and still make it viable. We use a turret mooring system that, again, is oil and gas technology. FPSOs and FSOs out in the North Sea have been using them for years, and they run hydrocarbons through them. So if they can do it with that, it's relatively easy for us to stick an electrical cable through. That turret's quite important, though, because it allows us to passively vein. Uh, 360 degrees and make sure that we always face into the incoming wave direction. Obviously, we need to do that to actually absorb the wave power, but also it creates that artificial harbour in the lee of it. And then the last bit, the, the unique bit, is our wave energy converter. And it consists of the float that you can see there and an oil hydraulic power takeoff system. It's a little bit different to most wave energy converters in that it only has one degree of freedom. Uh, we, we're not free-floating in the truest sense because it's, the motion is only relative to the, the stable platform, relatively stable platform. So it's a little bit different in that regard. Uh, I won't bore you with more details of that. You can ask if you want it. I have to put this one in because we have been in existence for 13 years. We've done half-scale testing. We've only spent 15 million euros. Most of that is private equity. And the reason for that is that we have some amazing partners who carry a lot of our costs, as the, the simple fact. And that's, that's some of them there. Why am I here? Well, we have two projects in the UK. As I said, the, the UK company Limited is commercializing the technology. We're working with a company called DP Energy, quite well known and respected. The reason for that is they're a project developer. We're not. We're a technology developer. Technology developers usually get forced down the road of being a project developer. We have been to some extent too, but we've managed to minimize that by partnering up with DP. And we're looking at two, two sites, and one of those is off the coast of Pembrokeshire. So that one is Duffed Floating Energy. That's the first and last time I'm going to say the name for two reasons. I've already been told that it's not a great name to choose in Wales. Um, and secondly, I'll probably pronounce it wrong, but my Danish colleagues and Irish project partners, trust me, they pronounce it much, much worse. So bear with me. The company was set up last year, it's registered in Port Talbot, it is just a registered office at the moment, but that will hopefully change in the coming year. Uh, and our intention with it is to develop it in stages. So we're uh, using a little bit of an approach, a bit like Maygen. Uh, we have a stage deployment, so we will look to consent and develop a pilot array, up to five devices. Uh, we will build that in two stages as well, we'll deploy one. And there's a very good reason for that. That is that when we deploy one, we only spend so much money, and then we can ask someone like Lloyds or DMV to certify that project, which makes it much cheaper to build the following stage. Uh, if you have certification, you can get much better finance deals. That's the aim, but ultimately, the reason there's such a big area, the, the green area that you can see there is our current area of search. It's actually not as of Tuesday it changed, but had already submitted the slides. Uh, but the reason that's so big is that there needs to be at least an opportunity to then expand that pilot array out to a commercial scale array. More than 20 units, probably somewhere in the region of 250 to 300 megawatts. Uh, and that's, that's our aim. Why wouldn't it be? Especially with DP Energy on board who, let's face it, that's how they make their money. They're a project developer. Um, yep, we're here in Wales. Honestly, there's a support of government. There is wave energy, which kind of helps when you have a floating wind and wave device. Uh, the water depth, all the, all the technical conditions were right for FPP. And then there's other, there's other things on the political side and things like that, that that help as well and really promote the area. A rough outline, this is not the prettiest slide at all, so I apologize for that. But by and large, what we're looking at is we are currently doing the screening. We have Marine Space preparing a screening report, and it's actually us that are slowing that down. But hopefully, that will be submitted to NRW in the next month. Uh, will then take that forward obviously to the consent and development stage, basically with the first device looking to be in the water in 2020, probably the second half of 2020 if we're realistic. And as I'm about to get the hurry up, uh, I'll mention the last thing, which is kind of relevant to what the whole panel is about. What does that mean for Wales? What are the supply chain opportunities? Basically, all of it. Uh, we as FPP, we're a device developer, but this is a big device. It's 3,000 tons of steel. It's a wind turbine. We're looking at building a few of them. We can't and don't want to build this ourselves. We don't have the facilities. We rely on a supply chain. And it's another reason we're in Wales. There is a really strong uh, positive supply chain. The reason this slide is generated the way it is, is there's going to be a lot of opportunities locally. 
but bear in mind that we are a technology developer and although we own a part of the project, we are ultimately a supplier to the project as well. So there's two halves to the supply chain, to the project company, that might be us or DP, and then to us personally. And uh, I would highlight the one to us personally is FPP because the project one is project specific. If you're a supplier to FPP, there's no territorial limit to where that could go. And there we go, I've been told to hurry up. Thank you very much. Cheers.